Welcome to the Ancestral Mind Podcast. My name is Colin Stucker, the founder and CEO of Wild Foods Co. and the AncestralMind.com. We're here to cover all things from an ancestral health perspective. We want you to build the ancestral mind so you can think about the decisions you make on a daily basis while considering the first principles of what makes you a sexy human beast, Brent. Yes, sexy. I love that you immediately segue to me every time you say the word sexy human beast. Makes I'm the me best feel, co-host you've ever had. Yeah, nobody else has called me that. I'm, we are here to lie. wake people up to the mismatch of our current environment so we can hopefully reverse the trend of our ailing health in our modern world, a place where all humans are going into the future as more and more countries around the world become industrialized and big food and big pharma and big government and all these big conspiracies take things over and destroy our health, keeping us plugged into the consumerist matrix. And I'm just going... I'm just going off. I don't even know where I'm going with that one. But you were just using the word big a lot. I, I, I feel like you were putting big, big in front big of a bunch of things, and then like they were bad automatically. Well, there you go, because that's going to segue perfectly into today's show, which is all about cognitive biases. Or yes. Bi- what do you think, biases or biases? I mean, I've heard it said both ways. I, I, I think it's biases. That, I mean, that's how I always said it. So Yeah, they um, both work. Pot- tomato, potato. Yeah, uh, that's what I was going to go with. For anybody who's wondering what the hell is a cognitive bias... Well, we're going to tell you what a cognitive bias is. Colin, what's your definition? Well, it's kind of, well, no, that's not, a, it's not as simple as that. I would probably say a, let's start with the bias. What's a bias first? Uh, so bias is just some preconceived notion that you may have or something that is going to taint the information that you have coming into your brain. So something that is not objective. Yes, so the opposite of objective let's, is well, let's, bias. Let's define objective. Like, let's really break it down to first principles here. Objective is something that is completely data-driven, something that it can be proven, can be repeated, and is it takes all feeling and all subjectivity, which would be the opposite of objective, yep. out of it. So, so objective is... The provable. opposite of subjectivity. The object, the opposite of opinion. That's probably a good way to say it. Yes. Bias, so, bias is opinion, right? A lot of times it's opinion we have that is subconscious, which is, you know, where a lot of the problems come from is because we don't even realize we have them. Uh, and we'll get into why that is from an ancestral perspective, obviously, because the Ancestral Mind Podcast, and so that's yep. what, we, what we do here. And then we're going to talk about some common examples of the most common cognitive biases, biases, now I don't even know how to say that word, that we experience in our day-to-day life. You will find this, you do these, you will find your parents do these, your brothers, your siblings, everybody. Th- these are human, I would probably say human failings in a way, like they're failings of the human mind. Hu- human mind. Failings of the human mind, Brent. Yes. they. They're, I, I hesitate to call them failings because they are failing us in a sense, but they did serve us at some point in our past. So they are simply pieces of the mind. They are causing bad things, but it doesn't mean that you're a bad person if you have these biases. It doesn't mean that you're stupid if you fall for some of this stuff. But being aware of them and understanding where they come from and why they come from those spaces is really important. So the the base definition, again, we didn't really define it as Oxford or um, whatever those other dictionary, dictionary people would do. But, but it is a, an un, a cognitive bias is an unconscious thing that your body does or your brain does to help you take shortcuts towards a conclusion or a solution. So if your brain always thought about everything the way it kind of should, you wouldn't be able to get anything done. So you take shortcuts. Heuristics. Yeah. Heuristics and cognitive biases are very interchangeable. In fact, some of the ones that we picked out are specifically denoted as heuristics as well. Yeah, I mean, so and a heuristic is a simple way to think of a heuristic as a mental shortcut. You're not talking into your mic. Doing a bad job. I mean, I can hear myself. Yeah, but you're not clear. I don't think I'm loud enough then. I mean, I should be able to be this close and it should be good. You're talking like, see your mouth? You're going like that way? But I can't, I can't, I can't see over my mic if I do that. See, that sounds really good when, you've, when you're directly there. Yeah, but but now it's just my eyes. And then as you move I mean, up. There's like people I see that talk like this, and it sounds good. They're not using a uh, condenser mic. I don't know. That sounds like a scam. 
All right. So we're we're um we were basically we just finished the elevator pitch and we could we could move on to the. I mean, you talked about heuristics. Yeah, I, I said some of them were going to be heuristics. Um, in fact, we would denote them as such, and then we were going to uh, we're like basically down here at what's the topic today. Okay, hold on. I'm hot. Like what? What's the temp at in here? Probably seventy two. But it's probably on heat because it was cold last night. There we go. <laughs> now the video people are like, huh? Okay. We're going to pick up um, heuristics. I can I can just go into what we just, bef- you know, be like, but first, what do we, or you can say, all right, bef- before we get into it, what have we done on the show recently or whatever? Okay. And we're back. <laughs> We didn't go anywhere. What are you talking about? Well, it's, all, it's just going to get a cut. Editing magic. We, we're we going to be truthful with people. We took a 10-minute break right there, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> uh, so heuristics, okay? Heuristics are mental shortcuts. And as Brent was saying, uh, biases, biases, however you want to say it, are ways that our brain kind of takes shortcuts to be able to form quick opinions or decisions on things. And the reason this served us in the past is because when you're in the wild and if you were to hear a bush, you know, ruffling or, or moving and it looked like maybe something was walking through, you know, the grass or whatever, like you would pretty much just assume danger because that's just going to be better in the long run than to assume it's, uh, you know, I don't know, anything else really, right? Like assume it's a lion versus just assume it's the wind yeah. and you're going to survive more often when you're assuming the first thing. So like that's Basically how they the served us. Opposite of every horror movie's plot where they're like, Oh, it's just the wind. And, and it's like a very clear ghost standing in front of them. Yeah. Well, and every horror movie is not <laughs> actually biologically accurate because humans don't assume it's the wind and then go investigate. Like both of those right there are just like <laughs> mismatched. Like you would assume it's bad and then go away, not assume it's not yeah. bad and then go towards it. We're right? going to keep sleeping in this haunted house and get it on tape. That's a real good idea. Yeah. So before we get into the, the meat and veggies of today's show and what, what have we done lately, Brent? Like, cause we are, we're seven, we're seven shows in We're seven shows in. That's crazy. We're already getting national press attention. We're already getting asked to be on Ellen and shows like that. I yeah. Mean, yeah. So Ellen was going to take a <laughs> selfie with us. Like I was pretty sure that was scheduled. I didn't really, she scheduled her selfies and, or that they were still a thing, but Interesting, yeah. So, uh, so what have Ellen, we done? What get have back we done? in touch with us in case you forgot that you were. Gonna what have take we done? Is that still an Ellen joke? Like, are you still going? Like, that, how long are you going to go off in your Ellen rant tangent? It's your fault. <laughs> you, you know, if you bring up Ellen, I want to talk about her. All right, look, we we just interviewed Ebony Kenny. We did. She's a dating coach. Did a whole episode that went almost two full hours on dating. That was fun. It was pretty awesome. Uh, we got to do a follow up show too. Th- we, oh, there will be follow up shows for talk sure. About all kinds of topics. And then we actually had a sister of Colin Stuckert on the show, Jamie Stuckert. She was on talking about uh, different types of addiction, different types of, like sugar from sugar to shopping, shopping addiction, uh, taking the plunge, working for yourself, you know, getting out of a bad relationship. A lot of things that. You know, I think are applicable to a lot of people that just aren't talked about that much, you know? Yeah. So th- those are both really interesting episodes that you need to check out. Um, and you can c- catch all of those on all of your favorite platforms. Platforms. But also, you can go to the ancestralmind.com and grab everything there. And we would highly, highly recommend and be thankful for a iTunes review. Yeah, that's it. Just, review us just, anywhere. Just, Any just review. We're we in really, love with you. We if you really do. appreciate that. Now, let's, well, add, since you're the ad guy, what is this episode sponsored by? Well, I, I'm the ad guy now. I've, now I have a new title. Episode 7 is my seventh title. The ad guy here is t- here to tell you this episode is sponsored by Wild Foods, Colin. Wild Foods has real food, real ingredients, and we get it to you in real time, especially if you order from us on Amazon.com. It'll be there within two days of uh, prime shipping. So check out wildfoods.co. If you don't care about prime shipping, you want prime shipping, go to Amazon. If you want more of a personal experience and you want to take advantage of discounts, you need to go to wildfoods.co. Yeah, and give us a little bit more of a percentage. Your your discount code, AM Podcast 12 only works on wildfoods.co. Call. And this is what happens, ladies and gentlemen, when you don't have scripts. <laughs> the worst ad ever. Somebody goes off script. <laughs> talked about. All right, let's just get right into the first cognitive bias. All right, we're going... Let, Let's well, so go. You Wait. have survivorship bias, but I really feel like confirmation bias is the number one. It's the most prevalent. I didn't put them in order okay. of like importance. I just so so when I kind of like picked these out for this episode, I was like, which of these do I think 
specifically tie into the ancestral mind or which of these do I wish I understood how they tied into the ancestral mind? We're only going to cover, mm-hmm. I think, specifically five of these cognitive biases. There there's are tons of them. There's, yeah, there's a lot. The, the most commonly researched, so there's about 25 or 30 of them. We're going to cover some of the most prevalent and some of the ones that you need to really understand in our modern world. Let's just get into it. Survivorship bias. Yeah. So, okay. So survivorship bias is the one that is the propensity to focus on the survivors of something to misjudge a situation. So some examples of this are lottery winners. You have somebody wins the lottery and you think that could be me too. And you may even have that lottery winner tell you, man, all I had to do was work hard, make enough money to buy enough tickets to keep buying lottery tickets. And eventually I won. Some entrepreneurs are an example of this. There are entrepreneurs that get there on purpose, but there are some that are there because they got lucky and they happen to be the survivors. Yeah, right, right time, right situation. I mean, there's always a little bit of luck involved in any success in a business, mm-hmm. business I would say. Uh, but is the lottery example really survivorship bias? That might be something else. Like, that might be, um, like, I don't know, like, recency, but not recency bias, but something that is the bias where it's close to you or it feels attainable. And so you reduce the odds of like, we are in gonna, your mind. We are going to talk about that one. That is, there's probably a little overlap in a lot of these, but specifically the, uh, the thing that I'm focusing on for the lottery winner is the fact that there is a face to the name for the lottery. So people continue to play the lottery because they think that that person is attainable. Maybe not that specific person. Like maybe a better example of the recency one would be if two brothers won specifically and everybody remembers those two brothers one so more brothers play the lottery or something like that Mm -hmm. but this is just lottery winners as a group tend to they're part of the survivorship bias they are the tiny 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 bit that survived did you see that in the literature you're researching did they use lottery as an example it just it's not computing in my brain well i'm going to investigate that on my own but let's talk about the the i think the ones that are a little bit more applicable success is definitely one uh like all of the right place right time that had happened for apple and microsoft or two obvious examples like right. Bill, Bill Gates, the massive uh, companies. I was reading a lot about, um, the, the advantages he had, like he had access to, uh, some of these big mainframe computers that you usually would have to spend a lot of money on. He had access at college somehow, and he was able to get access and just be on the computer for long periods of time. And I have to pay for it. There's all kinds of things like that. He was also the right place. Like he actually went to a college where they even had this computer. And at the time, a lot of them didn't even have them. So, you know, like imagine what his life would have been like if he went to a different college somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Like there's a lot of examples like that. Uh, for the, the more unicorn you go, like the bigger the company or the bigger the success story, t- there tends to be more variables that were in play to make that happen. Right. right. So what you miss is all the little people that didn't make it. Celebrities, another prime example. Yeah. Uh, when, you, when you think about Robert De Niro, you don't ever enter into your mind the 50,000 people that are Robert De Niro-ish or Robert De Niro adjacent that are waiting tables in the, the Hollywood and California general area. Um, disaster survivors are another real specific group. If somebody survived... Uh, while being inside of the World Trade Center, they might say to people, you know, all, well, all I had to do was like pray to God and he saved me or whatever. And some people may see a survivor of a disaster give their reasons for why they survived it and believe them because they see that this person made it. Well, okay, let me, I have some ideas on this. <laughs> I think the best way to go with this one so that people can understand something useful for their life like definitely the success thing is, is one of the things where we tend to look at the successful people and say, what did you do, right? Yes. And everyone's like, oh, well, if I just copy what either Robert De Niro did or Bill Gates did or whatever, then I'll be the next Bill Gates or Robert De Niro. Right, or I'll that, be the that next is the Facebook. fundamental or... flaw with the survivorship bias. Mm-hmm. Is because That's why it's dangerous. You're actually better off finding the thousand wannabe Robert De Niro's that failed and finding out what they did so you could do the opposite of what they did. Mm-hmm. Like that is more valuable than saying, oh, you're Bill Gates. What did you do? I'm going to try to do that, right? And that's that's really, I think, at the center of the survivorship bias. Now, there, there's another example that doesn't relate to success that comes to my mind. I've read about it a few times, but it was either World War One or Two. They were trying to find out why the fighter planes, I think it was World War Two, maybe, when, yeah. The planes that were surviving, the fighter pilots, which was the most dangerous position you could have in the military, might have even been in England, uh, that they were doing this, the planes that came back had bullet holes around the inside of the wing, right? Mm-hmm. And so what was their 
hypothesis based on that. Do you, have you heard this story before? I don't. I don't know. I have an, I actually have a World War story later okay. for one of the other biases, but I don't yeah, know this he, one. The helmets probably. Uh, yes. So they, they're like, well, there's all these bullet holes on the inside of the wings. Let's put armor there. Right. Right. But what they failed to recognize was the fact that the plane came back and had a bullet holes on the inside of the wing, implied that. It could survive bullet holes on the inside of the wing. Right. And that was the last had, place you needed exa- to put armor. They literally need to put armor on all the other places, right? And they couldn't really investigate wreckage. So it was one of those weird mind flips where you just have to kind of think about it a little bit hard. Mm-hmm. It, was actually, it was actually a mathematician that figured it out. And that's where a lot of the survivorship bias, uh, like a, a lot of research relates to that story. And it is fascinating because like at first glance, when you read the story, you're just like, oh yeah, you know, put armor where the bullet holes are. Right? Mm-hmm. But that's actually not what you have to do at all. In fact, you could make the plane too heavy and then not have enough armor in the other places where the planes that were going down were getting shot. Right, so, they could have been worse off. Exactly. So that that is probably the best way to describe the survivorship bias, I'd say, is find the examples of the things, more so find the things that you shouldn't do by studying kind of like the losers, the failings, the planes that crashed. Like, study them more than studying the planes that came back. And it's harder to study them because it, it is one, Less those, data. those people are dead. If they're, if it's a life and death situation they don't, Two, they're not going to broadcast. Yeah. Here's all the dumb shit I did to fail. They don't get know? media coverage as, as much. Yep. Like fi- who, who covers all the actors that fail? Like, fi- like you never see Nobody. that shit. Nobody. Covers I don't know that, any, right. Yeah. You could probably learn more from interviewing 20 struggling actors in LA than you could. F- I mean, in fact, I know you could, you could learn more from 20 struggling actors than 20, of the top of famous actors. Right. Like any day of the week. You're going to get platitudes all day yeah. from the and famous things actors. things that sound good and things that make them sound intelligent. And, and, and they're, they're, even their memory is going to be skewed because it's going to be like they're going to remember things that justify why they have success. Mm-hmm. When it might have been as simple as like, I literally met this person at this time and got this audition and they really needed somebody. And that was the breakout to my career. Like there's so many things like that that a lot of, I, I would assume a lot of actors probably don't even think about. Yeah. Right. Okay. That is actually a pretty good treatment of the survivorship bias. I feel like we really crushed that one. I feel like we're the plane that came back with the holes in the inside, and now we're going to armor up. Well, that's a bad analogy, but... Um. Oh, the, the helmets was a survivorship bias. Okay, I'm well, so stupid. Go, do it. Go. Is, okay, so just another World War story to kind of drive drive this home. In World War One, they finally started putting metal helmets on people. And what what happened was head injuries went through the roof. Like concussions and that kind of and injuries to their to their heads, Mm -hmm. gashes, what have you, went through the roof. So their original thought was these helmets are causing the extra problems because they have this giant metal thing on their head. So when they get hit, it hurts worse. Mm -hmm. Almost, you know, like putting a boxing glove on or whatever. And what they what they didn't look into was the death rate from head injuries from the, the like without the metal helmets. So what was happening was there were more injuries because there were less people dying from those injuries. So the helmets were making them less likely to die from the exact same injury. And they had a hard time discovering that originally. And they almost took the helmets away. It's so it skewed the numbers. It it had the effect they wanted, but the result ended up confusing them because yeah, that's, I know, man, like you just can't look at things at service level. Things are not obvious. A lot of times you have to really think about it and uncover the truth. So is there an easy way to break down survivorship as like an ancestral, how that, how our brain would have developed that particular bias in well, actually, the hunter gatherer wild? Here's a, this is actually one that's interesting. I don't think this is a human bias that much. Mm-hmm. The effect itself is it is an effect of like the, the, the winners and survivors, right? Okay. It's not really an innate human thing, right? Uh, you know, it's like human, like, our human history, human past, our human evolution, those that were careful in the wild are the ones that survive the most, right? So, but then, and I guess that really directs how we think about everything today, and that's what we like to talk about on the show, but I, I think this is effect is more of one of those broad category effects that maybe it confuses us because we have to really dig into the data, but it, but the effect itself is a result of like large numbers and statistics and survivors and winners and losers and, and whatever, right? Right. Uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely interesting. But let's get to one of my favorite ones. Yes. It's the best because we all do it every day of our lives. Confirmation bias. Go ahead, Brent. The, off. the confirmation bias, this is a rough one. I mean, this is, if, if we aren't careful, we'll talk about this for the next 35 minutes. But the confirmation bias is the tendency to seek or listen to only the information that confer, confirms your preconceived perceptions 
rather than take in all of the information. And I, I can break this down just in one quick, we're going to go into a lot of examples, but one real quick specific thing is if you want to look for the answer to something, do not Google that answer. Don't look for that answer. Try to figure out the question. Don't say, why are fats bad for me? Look for, are fats bad for me? Or why are fats good for me? What, Try to figure out both sides of that. What about, I think what you're trying to say maybe in another way is, don't look for the answer to the question. Look out, look for the, the thing that would disprove yeah, you got to look at both sides. I jumped ahead I mean, there. We're, that's supposed to be in the how to avoid it section. Yeah, yeah. But, um, but yeah, you need to. So what are examples? What are examples of confirmation box? Like how, how do we do this in everyday life? Like how do we, how does, how does so this. Much, there's so many, but I mean, obviously let's just pick politics, right? Po yeah, political ideology. Any real specific political ideology, what you'll what you'll happen to do is there's a couple ways this happens. One, I'm a Republican. One, I'm a Democrat. Okay, so what are my feelings on Item number one. Okay, well, I'm going to go look and see what the Democrats say that is. Okay, so those are my feelings. Yeah. Or what is that item? So let's say climate change, for instance. If you are, if, if in your mind you're like, I do not think climate change is a thing, what you will do is then go try to confirm that thought in your mind. You will go look for reasons why con, uh, uh, climate change is overblown and you is... Ignore data that disproves your correct. Points or you your you would it, it all the data might even come in, but only the data that matters is going to stick in your brain, and everything that you think is bad for you is going to go out the other side. Yes, and this leads us to one we'll talk about next. I don't know if you have it on there, but but it's cognitive dissonance. Now, the reason confirmation bias and cognitive dissonance are so associated is because th what happens when you receive information that conflicts with your belief system is you get that internal mental pain. It's like it's like a jarringness. Wow, this person said this thing that is completely against everything I believe or my identity or whatever, right? And people get very wound up in their political identity. They get wound up in their diet identity, whether it's keto or vegan or plant or whatever. Like, and so when someone comes at them and says, you know, you know, only animals are healthy or only plants are healthy or whatever, when when someone hears something that conflicts with their belief system, they get cognitive dissonance. And what that what leads from that is confirmation bias. Cognitive dissonance makes you basically ignore that information, ignore anything that conflicts with the things you subconsciously basically want to believe, right? Because we all right. have this identity and we want to maintain that identity. And then we seek out only or pay attention to only the information that basically feels good. It's like our brain's weird subconscious way of just screwing us over by like just saying like, no, this is, I'm only literally going to see, absorb, pay attention to, Remember information that supports the things that I want to see, believe, feel, et cetera. Yeah. And, and it leads to really ingrained beliefs, especially in the information age. So there's, a, there's interesting things that have happened in the information age. One of which is that there are entire sections of people who now are growing, which makes no sense. Like Flat Earth, for example has a growing community in an age where we have been to the fucking moon. Yep. It, I'm sorry. I'm not supposed to say that word. Been to the moon. Play it. Do it less. <laughs> yep. Uh, we, you know, we've been to the moon. We've taken pictures of our spherical planet. Well, you, you want to know so crazy about this is I've been seeing Joe Rogan talk about this a lot and just, you know, it's become more of a thing obviously. And it's like, there are some points that they can make that can arise doubt. If you really try to be, unbiased about it right like if you if you really just say pretend i'm a newbie like I, I like i'm alien visiting and i and i listen to each side each side's gonna have some legitimate points the side that's true is has the most points obviously because we all know that there's no flat earth right but uh th this is one of those examples of how like it each side of most things there is some truth but when we focus on only those and we ignore the entire picture all the data that's where we run to problems and that's where our human mind falls into these traps where we play, you know, we believe the things we want. We play favorites. If, if we, if we like somebody, we tend to value their opinion more. That's like the halo effect. If we don't like someone, nothing they say is good. You know, exa perfect example of like some like Trump, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and we'll get into that probably in the show, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a cool experiment to like, at least go see what they're saying. Like yeah, no, you, know, you, like, can't, it's you just, don't want to insulate yourself from right, the information. Like, just go like listen to a flat earther, right? Or like watch a YouTube video. And I mean, 
if you really watch one of these long videos they put off, like you can just see so much bias. Like after after a while, you're like, wow, there's just so much like human failing here. But it's at least a good practice for most of us to just remind ourselves to be a little more open-minded, less dogmatic, right? Even if, even for things that we know, like we know one plus one is two, but what if we ever are able to reach other parallel universes where one plus one is actually three and everyone in that universe knows that one plus one is three? Like there's just, so I, I just think a good, and a good way to combat all bias is to just really, as Socrates said, like know that you know nothing yeah. and, and, and treat everything as if you're a true beginner and really try to evaluate every side and so we'll get a little bit more into some of the strategies on how to combat bias, but I think confirmation bias is crazy. And like another one is kind of like when you buy a red Chevy, whatever, right? You start seeing red Chevy, whatever, everywhere, right? Right. And that's just, I think it's confirmation bias, or it might be another one. They, but it's it's just it's a way that there's a heuristic attached to that too. I don't yeah, know what it is. Your but. brain just kind of is more susceptible to seeing that data so it does even though the reality is nothing has changed yeah. in, in the actual numbers right conspiracy theories are another great example i mean you'll flat earth is one of them but if you believe one conspiracy theory you are more likely to believe others whether they're related or not so that means that the more likely connection there is that the by bi the cognitive bias of confirmation is different for those groups of people that are more likely to believe conspiracy theories back and forth and finally, fake news. You know, okay, so fake news has been trumpeted by the president as something else. Basically, anything that is mean to him is fake news or whatever. But it was a legitimate problem, and it was a legitimate problem that he was able to usurp as part of his campaign very smartly. He uses it now. Yeah, he still uses it. He fake uses news it differently. Him. He changed yeah, the meaning. It's a, it's a perfect heuristic for him. Yeah, it's like oh, I can just dismiss you with one with two words. Yeah, and it actually is very useful. <laughs> and it's a and it was a legitimate problem that he kind of turned around. But the legitimate problem here is if I have this belief, if I if I say believe that there's the the Earth is flat, what am I going to do? I am going to spread any and all information about the Earth being flat via Facebook, via Twitter, and I may even go as far as to creating a fake news article or being a fake source for that news article. And when it gets spread virally like that among a group, that's what was originally meant by fake news. Well, or you're perpetuating something that you read somewhere or that someone told you. Yes. That is just like a... I mean, it reminds me of Chinese tel uh, phone, Ch Chinese telephone or something. Do you know what that is? It, it, the game. Of, I don't know if it's Chinese specifically, but the game of telephone where you, I think it's I think it's once it goes through thirty yeah. people, it doesn't sound anything you like what it originally sounded. Basically, re repeat something to person to person person, and by the by the time you go through enough people, it's not even close to what the original thing was, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a perfect example of that. And, and fake news is is a real thing, and even if you're not spreading it by posting about it, confirmation bias will have you finding the information yes. to support the thing you want to believe. Yep. And that is the real danger. And it's both sides of the aisle. You, you need to really understand that if we're talking specifically about American politics, Republican versus Democrat, if you watch Fox News or if you watch the Young Turks on YouTube, either one of those sources is presenting fake news in different ways. Uh, they are presenting it. it they're, some of them may not outright lie but they are twisting everything and then you're spreading that and causing that to continue to happen because they'll say something that resonates with you that confirms what you already thought. Oh, President Trump is going to jail on Monday. Yes, I knew President Trump was going to jail on Monday. I'm going to spread that. Yeah. And no, he's not going to jail on Monday. You know, like that's... It, or you, more subtle forms. I mean, there's a lot of examples of just... Yeah. What does the media do? It sens sensationalizes everything. Because why? Because media companies are... One, they're, are, they're all struggling for attention. The more attention they have, the more dollars they have. Every single media company in the world right now wants to get as many eyeballs on its content as possible, right? You do that by having the most outrageous, biggest attention-grabbing headlines, right? It's the entire system, the entire business model is flawed. And I hope it, I hope it changes at some point. I hope it like yeah. implodes and we start with something new. But that's just a, a whole another Even problem. Even though we itself. went down a little bit of rabbit hole there, I want to plug a little bit of cryptocurrency again. I... I just because I have so much knowledge about this. Um, ben Swan is a guy who was an independent reporter. He managed to piss off both Fox News and CNN. He was fired from Fox News and CNN wouldn't touch him because he didn't conform to either of those molds. He mm -hmm. would just kind of 
go nuts on either one of them if he thought he saw something wrong, right? Mm -hmm. He had some weird theories, like, or not theories, but he went into some weird things. Like, he was about, he liked the Pizzagate thing, and he talked about it, but what was important is he mostly did fact-based reporting, and he was canned from those networks and and blackballed, basically. Like, they didn't want him, even though he supported most of what he did with facts, right? So, one of the cryptocurrencies actually went ahead and revived him and started paying him from their treasury, their decentralized autonomous organization. To support him, basically. And they cre- he had a channel again. Mm-hmm. He went on, on YouTube. He was powered by them. And he wasn't beholden to ratings, and he wasn't beholden to a station's philosophy. He was a very good, with deep connections investigative journalist that was allowed to operate outside of the norms, which is couldn't not just what have you U- see. Couldn't he just, he just have a YouTube channel? He, but he wouldn't because it's not worth his time. Well, so Ben Swan is, a, he's basically a celebrity. He makes a ton of money. He will make a ton of money doing other things other than investigative journalism because of his connections. So he wouldn't just start a YouTube channel and hope that it got the ball rolling and made him any money. Okay, we're, we're going too far down a tangent. So, <laughs> so what's the bias here? Uh, no, no, I was just saying that, that was part of the... Uh, issue with the the news and you were going into that so i was just saying it was cool that they're in the future we may have legitimate journalists being bankrolled by different things that are not big media companies that all have the same goals they all it, the entire news outlet needs to become more decentralized and more i mean news comp a news company to me almost seems like an oxymoron like something that shouldn't be allowed yeah right if you're supposed to report news you should be unobjective yet they are all subject they are all biased they are all something because someone's mm-hmm. paying for them someone owns them whatever like there's just so much nonsense and the news is a scam and i don't think anybody should basically watch it for the most part i'm gonna put something in the show notes uh that you can check out there is a really funny video uh on the sinclair broadcasting system or on the sinclair broadcasting network where every local news station said the exact same thing in the exact same inflection and at the end said this is dangerous for our democracy and it and they just put each news station on top of the other one and you just see that there's like a hundred of them saying all the exact same words. Oh, so basically implying that someone at the top was... Yes, yeah. very. It, 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 sure. it, they have to run a certain story if you are a Sinclair Broadcasting Station. Oh, yeah. You're required to run a certain story at the beginning of every one of your broadcasts yep. if asked and you cannot change the words Yeah. So or you're fired. For the Ancestral Mind podcast yeah, yeah. and for confirmation Let's bias. Let's move back. For confirmation bias though, the news is important to understand. When you watch the news... You are being manipulated in, in one way. Either you're manipulating yourself because you're seeking out the information that you want to believe, which we all kind of do that, or you're being manipulated by the, the news outlet themselves and their bias and their agenda, mm-hmm. right? A lot of times it's a combination of both. People that like Fox, Fox News always watch Fox News. People that like, honestly, I don't even know news, so I don't even know what the other channels are. Maybe CNN is CNN whatever. is, in theory, the opposite of Fox News. Yeah. Um, one fun thing that I did was on election night, I switched between the two back and forth, back and forth, and it was awesome. Like, CNN was saying, oh, it's a coin flip, yep. and and Fox News was already calling it for Trump, and then if you go online and do some objective research, which was on the betting markets, you would see that you had to lay 10 to 1 to bet on Trump, which meant that he had a 90% chance to win, and mm-hmm. it meant that Hillary was not a coin flip, which yep. would be a 50-50, so it's, yep. it's funny. Be always, always, always look at the opposition Maybe you don't have to look at it as something as ridiculous as flat earth, but I promise you there's something that we think is ridiculous today that in three or in 30 years, we're going to be like, how did we think that it was ridiculous? It could be three years, Brent. It could be three, yeah. With as, with as much information we create, I th- I'm pretty sure every year the, the amount of information now doubles. Yeah. Like, think about that. The amount of total information available in the entire world, we're at a rate where it basically is doubling. I'm pretty sure it's doubling. Maybe someone can look that up and let me know, but I'm pretty sure it's doubling. That's insane. But it also means the amount of bias, the amount of dogma, the amount of crap information is also doubling. Yes. Right? So you have to be even more vigilant than ever to question everything, question yourself. And especially, this is this is it, ladies and gentlemen, especially when you get fired up about something, try to unfire yourself. Try to unfire yourself up by saying, I'm going to go literally try to disprove this thing I believe right now. Do it as just an exercise. When you, it will actually help you it will also strengthen your belief and it will give you a solid kind of justification if you do that 
so that you can still believe that thing. Or maybe it pulls you a little bit back to the middle end of the spectrum where most things, the most truth, the golden mean, as Aristotle said, is somewhere in the middle. Now, this is what um, Charlie Munger does. You know who Charlie Munger is? No, I'm not familiar. Really? Warren Buffett's partner? Uh, that makes a little bit more sense. Yeah. I, I can't picture him though. Well, he's kind of like the less popular, like really smart kind of philosopher, armchair philosopher type of um, partner to, to Buffett. And he is really famous for his points on, he actually talks about bias a lot. He's, he's like written books about it and done speeches about biases and mm-hmm. stuff. And he talks about how you should always, actually this is what he says. He says, you should never argue a point until you can, argue the opposite point at least as well as yeah. the primary point, right? And who does that though? Like what humans, it's hard. What humans are going to spend time to do that? It, it takes a so, lot of time too. It takes, but it takes time. It takes also self-awareness and it takes the ability to have that cognitive dissonance. Now let's talk about con- cognitive dissonance. It's before the bandwagon effect, but this is a perfect segue. So as I said before, and are you familiar with dissonance, Brent? Yes. Okay. Well, we talked about it already. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's basically like when... Your belief system is challenged. Yeah. Right. And how hard that is to. To just cope with. Yeah. To like be able to function. And, and what you see most people, what they do is they deflect. They add hominin, which is they basically attack the character of the person. Yes. And they do all these things. What aboutism is another common one. What is that? What aboutism? Go ahead. Uh, what aboutism would be. Um, <laughs> but her emails is one of them. You know, what is that? But her emails when you're talking about Hillary, but her emails. Yeah. So, well, okay. I guys, I'm a political noob. So <laughs> let, let's keep it like understandable for, yeah, I'm not trying, I'm not trying to get, I'm not trying to get political. It's just the first one that popped in my head, but basically a, what about it is a, what about ism is you say something that's unrelated. Like, like let's say Colin punched me in the face right now and he punched me for no reason whatsoever. And I'm like, dude, why did you punch me in the face? That's ridiculous. You shouldn't have done that. And then Colin says to me, will you punch that guy at the bar last night? Yeah, you try to make connections and justify things. And like, and I'm like, what, do you, what? That doesn't have anything to do with you punching kind of me in the face. It's a deflection, isn't it? It's not a form of deflection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It, 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 it shows weakness in the argument not and as much as an ad hominem attack. And an ad hominem is attacking the character. So if Colin punched me in the face, he would say, no, I punched you in the face because, you know, you like Trump and I think that's bad so i punched you in the face or whatever like you you deserved it because this or whatever or yeah. or maybe i say colin your punch in the face is worse than uh logan punching me in the face because when you punch me in the face i know you are stronger so it's worse <laughs> or something i don't know it's just it's basically some kind of deflection that's is sidestepping the point so you don't actually have yeah. to answer you it. normally see it in like in like a a case where somebody's on trial and you bring their character into question rather than bringing the facts of the case into question. Right. Well, and I just had a kind of a Facebook, I would say maybe debate uh, that this exact thing happened. Okay. So I posted about pro-life or, or, or abortion or something. And it was, it was more about not the choice between pro-life or, or, or pro-choice, but it was just about before we even talk about abortion, let's talk about what the principles are of biology. Like if you, kill a fetus you are preventing life or let's just say for simplicity because you know if you get murder and all these other words in people get they just freak out so like let's just focus on the basics if you intervene to prevent a pregnancy you are you are you are preventing someone life like that's just it's one of those one plus one equals two like it's infallible it's it's it just is the way it is all the other stuff is opinion everything else and someone was responding to that and i don't remember exactly what he said but it was kind of like you know I made the point about like, this is about biology. This isn't about opinion. My entire post was about how it's not actually about opinion, et cetera. And then he came back at me and he's like, he kind of made this snarky comment of like, oh, well, you know, if it's about biology, then just this, that. And, and, but since you said biology, then it's just, he's, it was basically completely not addressing my point, mm-hmm. but it, but he was using biology and trying to make fun of it as a way to kind of discredit my argument without actually addressing what I said at all. Yep. Like, and that's probably what you see most often. And what happens, especially on online forums and, even discussions, humans are really bad at this. We have a really hard time to not get sucked into those tangents. That's why so much. Political- That's why this episode is taking so long so well, far. Well, but even, but when it comes to debate though, yeah, it's like, we just feel like we have to respond to every stupid thing someone says, even though they're, they might be childish or they might be being sarcastic or whatever. And that is a way that it makes people feel like they can kind of continue conversation and not be disproven wrong. But if you, if I was simply like, well, refute my statement and I literally did not get sucked into any of those side tangents and I was like let's get back to this let's get back to this let's get back to this you know 
if we could do that and actually, you know, you can make progress and that's what we need more of is people just kind of addressing one thing and kind of either yes. coming to a common ground or disagreeing and agreeing to disagree or whatever. But instead we just go off on these infinite tangents of like, we could do just, a whole episode on how to argue um, and, yeah. and how to successfully get your point across. One of the things I was going to say to help you avoid the confirmation bias is to actually engage in intelligent conversation with those with the opposite view. Um, if and, you can find some that will do that. It, and and it, it's on both sides of everything. There's going to be somebody who is intelligent that is either misled or you're misled and you're the intelligent one and you're also misled. So you just have to find those people and you have to talk to them. Like I, I have very, very, very strong opinions, valid or what I believe are valid opinions from research on vaccinations and how the anti-vax movement is extremely dangerous. But I will often actively engage with those that believe that vaccinations are dangerous themselves. Well, you should talk to Allison then. And I, <laughs> I am avoiding, I am avoiding that intentionally. Uh, but the, the, it is, it's in, it, it's definitely interesting to engage with somebody who has the opposite opinions of you. That's, I also, when I go around on Facebook, I engage with those that have the opposite political beliefs as me as well. M mostly, like I'll, I'll talk with them on their posts again. I try to do it intelligently. I do the same thing when I, I will post and say, Hey, this per, uh, those people that have this opposite belief of me, tell me why that kind of thing. And those people that agree with me, I want you to tell me like, for instance, I made a post. I'm like, if you hate Trump, I want you to tell me one good thing about him. And if you like him, I want you to tell me one bad thing about him. And that was the entire point of the post. And I, I actually got some very interesting, good discussion out of that post. I would actually recommend, I, I don't necessarily recommend I would people do this. Like, honestly, I think, I think most of this is a waste of time. I think the problem with all of this is that you're not going to change anyone's mind and you probably just maybe your own though. You're yeah. I, but I don't even think that really like, and it's just going to be frustrating. Like I don't have the stomach for it. I just, it's such a waste of time. Now, some people, they like doing it, whatever they want to go on Twitter and like debate or whatever. And most of that is just mental masturbation. Really is all it is. And <laughs> yeah, so maybe debating with people was a bad thing, but what you should do is look up the opposite of your opinion and yes. try to find good sources. Try to disprove. And, and try to understand the opposite of your opinion. If you do that, you will come to a better conclusion. And I hate to be that enlightened centrist, like stupid shit, but the the answer very often will lie in between of a hot button of a hot button issue. And it that's why it's you know, like everybody knows it's wrong to kill all the Jews. But not everybody knows it's wrong to have a school system that is based on where you're located and why that might be accidentally racist and that kind of thing. So there's like real, uh, there's real conversations to be had where the answer is probably somewhere in the middle that people miss for the big picture. And that's why there's so much rage behind this stuff. So try to find your way around that and realize that there's smart people and there's dumb people. Not everybody that disagrees with you are the dumb people. Well, and you need to ask questions if you're going to do anything. And I think it's really hard for us all to do. None of us, we, we just, not none of us, but most of us do not use the Socratic method enough. Like if you were to approach conversations like that with pure questions, very few statements, I just think that's the best way you're actually going to learn yourself. It's also going to be the best way to maybe open up someone else's mind. You know, that's why the Socratic method is taught in law school. Like it's, 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 it's the best way to get a human to just think outside of their bias, right? It's mm -hmm. just use questions and make them justify themselves. All right, let's move on. Yes. Th let, that that one took longer than we intended. Let, I'm sorry. Less, less news. Like I just, I just, I mean, I hate the news and I hate politics. So we need to do a little bit less of the, of the current stuff. We need to, let's, let's even try to keep this like conversations you have with your significant other or your friends or your family. Like let's find the, or your coworkers even, right? Like how do you deal with people? with that and how do you not make mistakes yourself in your judgment which is another which is really the, the biggest thing we want everyone to accomplish by understanding your bias is to just make better decisions in your life like so let's maybe at the end we'll, we'll wrap up with some ideas on how to do that but we have another one that is the availability heur heuristic that's number two or Wait, number you skip the bandwagon effect. oh i just skipped the bandwagon okay do bandwagon <laughs> bandwagon is a little bit at least a little bit related to what we were just talking about but the bandwagon effect is the odds that a, a single person has a belief goes up as the number of people also believing it goes up, even disproportionate to whether it's true or not. People refer to this as groupthink. People, uh, the groupthink is like another more specific term of the bandwagon effect. 
but you'll see this with uh, religions or cults that will that will sprout up. And as they get more and more people, they're more likely to get more and more people and kind of have that exponential growth. Well, or, but what about just the fact that if a lot of people believe something, <clears throat> humans are more likely to believe it. it. This is just straight biology. Yeah, and there's a little more to it. Like, imagine a mob, uh, a mob that's going crazy and, and yelling about something. It's entirely possible that you knew nothing about that thing going into that mob, but the energy and the group think in that mob, you will have, or you're way more likely to have at well, least why, that belief in that moment. Why? I, well, I don't know. I don't know the reason behind that. I don't know the biological well, reason. That's probably it. an ancestral easy key that we can segue to. Okay. If everybody in the street is looking up the sky, what are you going to do? Yeah. Yeah. It's getting in an elevator, everybody pointing in one direction and you get well, in point the same direction. If everyone is looking at the sky. What are you going to do? You're going to check it out. Right. <clears throat> because if you don't, there might be some huge comet hurling to or plane or bomb or whatever hurling to you're all everyone's death. Right. Yeah. It is a safety heuristic. Almost everything we are designed, and this is kind of a broader picture to understand the ancestral mind. Almost everything we do from a behavior point of view is either to help us survive or help us procreate. Like if you think about, we're animals and we have to survive so we can procreate. That is our primary directive as a homo sapiens sapiens. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the reason if there's a big mob and they're all kind of doing this thing, whatever, we're drawn to that. We're, it's like a magnet. We want to be sucked into that which is the same thing with like you have soccer hooligans and all the stuff. It's because going with the group is natural, whereas going against the group is a survival disadvantage. Right. right. You're more likely to be trampled on. You're more likely to be. What is a school of fish? What is it? What is, why do you have flocks of birds that can like do these crazy patterns and fly together? Uh, well, when, I don't know if that's this thing, but they're it's the same thing. No, no. It, <clears throat> it, it, when you're in a group, either a school of fish or a flock of birds, you reduce the likelihood that you're going to be prey. Oh, oh, yeah, the yeah, The numbers yeah, yeah, affect, okay. right? So it's the same way for humans. The more humans in a group that can work together, think together, et cetera, the more survival you're going to have. And if you break free from that group, a lot of times you become lunch, breakfast, or dinner. So bandwagon effect is probably the easiest to observe in our species and why it is from an ancestral point of view because, you know, like this is how we, this is how we survive. You know, Brent, what is our primary evolutionary niche that humans figured out? That survival and group survival. and group, yeah, group survival. Yep. <clears throat> so survival of the group is survival of the individual. Okay. Uh, so why is it dangerous? Well, it's super dangerous because you could have a wrong belief, or you could have a choice, like lemmings, for instance, when they go jump off the cliff, and they all jump off the cliff because all the lemmings are jumping off the cliff. Like there is, there's bad things that can happen, and I'm going to very specifically point at the the Third Reich in in Germany. I mean. The, I, the group of people that thought that killing all the Jews was good had to be a tiny amount of a tiny group at first, but it got bigger and it got bigger. And because of the bandwagon, it seemed like less of an evil thing as they went on and on. Well, it's also the propensity to just kind of follow the group, follow even superiors and, you know, and, and not stray from the pact or the rules or whatever, yeah. you know? So uh, you have to actively question is what we're doing good is what we're doing a good thing should i do this because everybody's doing it is everybody doing the right thing or is everyone doing the wrong thing i don't know but you gotta actively question that you see anything that you see everyone talking about and this is prevalent in our society today with almost everything in fact there's a good heuristic it reminds me of what mark twain said anytime i find myself on the side of the majority it's time to pause and reflect yeah. Yep. Uh, that's... And generally, and this is a very weird paradoxical thing because you would think the more people making a decision, the more likely it is to be right. But what we tend to find is that the more humans that think the same way, the more likely that those thoughts are to be flawed in some way or extremely flawed. Right. right? And you get things like uh, scientists, and I'm, I'm reading the book now about Ansel Keys and the whole fat hypothesis and how the scientists of the day just, they didn't want to hear uh, counter- counter views they don't they don't want to look at research they don't want to question their own beliefs and it just became this thing that that perpetuated by a few select individuals that eventually resulted in a lot of the issues we have in our country today with our food and our nutrition advice and it's just like it's insane that you you, you take scientists even that are humans but are supposed to be objective researchers they're mm -hmm. supposed to be unbiased and they're actually can be some of the most biased people there are which right? is why peer review is so important <laughs> that ideally you'll find people that are not biased and they will review your work and be like no no 
vitamin C does not increase your immune system. I don't know why you thought that A equals B, but no, it doesn't. Yep. And and so peer review your own self all the time. Try and f- ask somebody, am I doing the right thing here? Whatever. You if know, you can't disprove something you believe, like if you can't disprove it with something, a reasonable argument, then you have no right to even say or use that information in your own life. Like that should be a prerequisite. You should try to at least understand the best argument against the things you believe. Yes. And very few of us can do that about almost anything, really. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Availability heuristic. What's that? Well, that's the that was what you were alluding at to before, which is the tendency to overvalue information that's available to you easily versus information that's harder to get. So uh, kind of an example of that would be, I know a fat guy that's perfectly healthy, plays football, so it's okay to be fat. Um, just because that information was easy for you to get because you knew a guy doesn't mean that it's good information. Isn't this also confirmation bias, though? Like the idea that the, the one, I, I know guys smoked every day and lived to be over 100, so therefore it's okay. Like these are kind they're, of confirmation bias. They're always going to have some overlap, but specifically you just happen to know a guy is a lot different than going out and finding a guy. So yeah, well, the confirmation it, bias is I'm going to go look at people until I find somebody who's 100 years old and has smoked every day of their life. This is just, it's already there. Like you already knew that person. Well, they Recency bias. Yeah. Ideas that are fresh in your head or you just buy, bought a car or whatever. Like yes. your brain tends to go there more quicker because it's just, it's most recently available. Mm-hmm. So, And that's, that's just biologically the way your memories work because your memories are older. The older they get, the less reliable they become. And yep. I think our brains understand that. So they're always going to access the newest information first. Yep. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, another couple examples. Yeah. Europe is really expensive. Uh, I just went to London. I bought a beer and it was $14. Well, just because the one beer that you bought in the one city that you went to in Europe was mm-hmm. expensive does not mean that Europe is expensive. Yep. Um, again, another form of confirmation bias, right? Yeah. Like picking one data point. Well, even if up- you, you may not have had that thought before you bought that beer, but just because that information was the easy information for you to get, you didn't go out and search for alternative information and you didn't go out to search for is Europe cheap or is europe expensive you just bought something you're like yeah it's expensive now why do why do humans fall victim to this heuristic i mean let's think about this ancestrally what what benefit would we get from having to think as little as possible well that's the same benefit from all the heuristics but what benefit will we get from accessing the information that's easy to get to we didn't have to think globally when we were in a group of 20 people so if you went to a cave and it was dangerous to go in that cave, then caves were dangerous. You didn't need to know that there were a thousand caves that were safe for the one that was bad. There's another, there was one that was bad. There's another variable though. If you, if you think about what uses up the most energy in the human body, what is it? Um, the brain. Oh, okay. It's about 20% of your total, total, total calorie expenditure. Interesting. So thinking, right? Think, and think about this though. (laughs) Think about this. What do most I don't people, know. I don't know. What what do most people not like to do in their life? Because it's like it, exercise. No. Well, I mean, I know people that will exercise, but they won't spend time to think about shit. You know how few people think about things like on any kind of deep level. I like, do know how few. It's very. I mean, open I'm, Facebook. This is very. This is actually a rare thing. Most people don't like to think and go deep, and this is a skill that if you acquire it, you'll have a huge advantage today. But this is biologically a reason why, because it, it, it's a very calorie expensive, right? It's, it it's costs a lot of calories to think. It's just the way it is, right? And, and to think deeply and to think long and do all these things. So, Colin, are you telling me that if I think about things a lot more? You will burn calories. Oh, that's amazing. You want it, you want I'm going to do a lot more thinking. You, you want to know why I'm tired on days where I literally just sat all day in front of my computer? Like, I can still feel exhausted after that. Yeah. Even though I barely moved, right? Because I'm still expending a lot of energy. Yeah, that's a good I, point. I, I don't recommend doing that. I think you should walk and move and think. But um, it's it's a thing. So let's get on to the next one. All right. The, uh, the, what did we just... We just did the availability so one. Why? So this is the one that's going to kind of bring it all together. And we've talked about all these different biases. This one is the most important to me. And that's the blind spot bias. And that is the tendency to be unable to notice the biases within yourself... But be actively understanding the biases of other people. So I can see when Colin is falling for the confirmation bias. And I'll even point it out to him and tell him, no, it's confirmation bias, bro. But when he says it to me, I think he's stupid. Mm -hmm. And I'm missing it when I'm doing it. You need to understand that these are not 
dumb people biases. These are human cognitive biases. And falls everyone falls for these. So understanding more and more about them, why they happen, how they can happen, and what they are is extremely important for you to be thinking properly. Well, what are some strategies for that? Because I I talk about self-awareness a lot. And, you know, obviously self-awareness, bias, et cetera, these are all things that are very closely intertwined, a lot of overlap. And I just, I don't know. It's it's hard to give someone like a five-step process to like overcome bias, you know? Like there's so many examples, there's so many variables. I mean, I, I think asking questions of really just why you do what you do and what you believe. Like yeah. most people, like there's a, I think it was a Toyota CEO. He used to be like, if you ask f- why five times, you'll start getting close to the truth. Imagine that five times. Most people don't ask why even once. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Imagine asking five times, like why I do that? Okay, that's your reason. Okay, but why do you think that way? Okay, well, what caused you to think that? Like, you know, why, why, what, 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 when, 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 where, where? So what, what else can we do in our life to just combat bias, to be more self-aware? It's, it's tough. First of all, you want to start by listening to this podcast. Uh, you also want to subscribe on all of our channels, YouTube, maybe That's the best thing e- you do. mailing lists. That is, that is the number one thing that you're going to do to try and expand your mind here. But what are some of the other things that you might be able to do? Uh, What's worked for you? Be, bet- be better at Googling is the number one thing that's been okay, how, worked how? for me. What, is that, what does that look like? So I always, when I've, I have strong opinions on very few things. I'm willing to change my mind on a lot of things. I've done it a lot of the different times in my life. Um, and, you know, for I'll even give a political example of me changing my mind. Back about, you know, say 15 years ago, I thought climate change was stupid. I thought everybody who was going on trying to save the environment was an idiot. Uh, I was thinking that it was overblown. Like, mm-hmm. obviously, there's some things you need to do, but it really doesn't matter. Blah, blah, blah. And since then, I've looked into it and challenged my own belief there, looked at both sides of this equation and been like, nope, I am a lot closer to the, this is an impending disaster thing than I was. This is stupid. So back in the day, I think the ability to change your mind, the ability to change your mind is number one. You cannot have a set view. You have to be open to changing your mind. So how can, how can we give someone a call to action? Like think about the times you've changed your mind. Right. And for most people, they change their mind on like a, a, yearly every five year every 10 year basis like it's a very slow process it paradigm shifts are right. hard it's very hard it, because again like identity ego these things are all tied into us as human beings and to to challenge them we get that dissonance and we don't like that dissonance like, no. we want to think we know everything we want to think that at least what we know is true etc and we'll do everything to defend that but what i've noticed is if you can just and i'm just going to give some examples of i think things that have worked for me i don't have an exact playbook, but there are definitely some things I've done that have helped just the ability to change your mind. But in fact, take a step back and just say, I'm going to not be so, what's the word? If you're like vehement or, um, dogmatic, well, dogmatic. Yeah. But like, I'm, I'm going to be a little bit less passionate about what I believe. Like, I think people get too passionate about their beliefs yes. and it ties them to them too much. Well, right? once you engage emotion, they get, they get fanatical. Like, yes. how do you think like you get radical terrorists, right? Like, they just compound and compound and compound the same dogmas over and over and over again. And then they breed hate and hate and hate and they breed us for STEM, et cetera, et cetera. And it's like, we need to stop that. We need to become more, I don't know. In fact, this is this is something I always try to visual, visualize myself. I visualize myself if my beliefs are challenged or if someone tries to say this or that or whatever, I just, I visualize myself shrugging my shoulders. I don't know. Hmm, interesting, Right. Doing things like that, and this is an example of where kind of form can fall and function, where you can literally use your biology to trick your brain. Just be a little bit less dogmatic, shrug your shoulders, be willing to say, I, oh, this is a big one. This is a big one, Brent. You ready oh, for this? Oh, here we go. Wait, 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 wait. You wait, ready for this? Wait, wait, wait. Yes. Oh, shit. Did I just lose it? No. Wait. This is a big one. This is a big one. Wait, oh man, I can't recreate it. Where, where was I like, going no, with that? No. Um, oh, the bomb no. screwed me up. No, no. It was. Oh my God, I swear, we're going to have to like pause the show because I can't figure this out. Okay, so shrug your shoulders. Be willing to say interesting. Oh, this is it. This is it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Tell people and even yourself say, hmm, let me think about that. That's it. I'm telling you, I swear, I swear saying, let me think about it immediately makes your brain 
be just a little less dogmatic, a little less connected to that identity. And what I found is like, when people say, when people say, I'm not sure, let me think about it. You convey actual trust to them. It's actually a really good persuasion technique mm -hmm. because you know, people that are just like, oh, this is the way it is. Like, you know, we tend to kind of clam up a little bit and not want to trust them as much because they just are, are a little bit too, uh, you know, too dogmatic or too like direct in, in what they think, or whatever. And we tend to be a little bit um, suspect of that. Like we feel like, oh, maybe they're scamming us or lying to us or whatever. But when someone's like, I don't know, I need to think about that. You're just like, wow, okay. So they're actually taking the time to think about it. They're not committing to one side or the other. I, I just feel like it is such a, it's it's actually, actually probably a good heuristic and trick to do for yourself. If you find yourself getting sucked into dogma, it's just be like, you know, that's, that's interesting. Let me think about that. You know, even if you really kind of don't feel that way, it will at least kind of open the door for your brain to maybe explore the alternative side. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's a big one saying, you know, I'm not sure. Let me think about that. Or, you know, even if you like make your point and it's, con it's maybe it's conflicting with someone say, like, that's interesting. I'm going to think about that. What I feel right now is probably this and just kind of approach it with a little bit more of an open door policy than a, no, this is the way it is, right? I think we get too caught up into that, into these definitive statements. And Only to... the Sith deal in absolutes, Colin. Sift? Who's the Sith? Sith. Sith? Darth Maul? Is that, is that Star yeah, Wars? Yeah, it's a Star Wars, Star Wars reference. Yeah. Give me the wah, wah, wah for that. Brent. I, I don't have that one. Oh, up. come on. I'm going to give myself a coin. Okay. No, you can't reward yourself for... <laughs> yeah, I can actually. I can reward myself all I want. I've got the coin right here. Well, what else? So for me, reading books, uh, challenging, talking about discussions and being, enjoying kind of good, deep discussions, not necessarily debates, I think is very helpful. It's You really have to find people that can do this though. Like my buddy Monster. Tough. My buddy Monster's really good at this because he's just not the type to get like heated. Like you could give him conflicting views all day and he'll kind of like... I mean, in fact, we're going to have him on the show and we're going to talk about this, but he tends to like make you feel like he heard what you said. And this is probably a good strategy for anyone that wants to like persuade people. And then he's like, you know, what's interesting or I feel like, or like he uses these kind of like disclaiming preferences that people don't feel like you're discrediting what you just said. Yeah. Ch right. Challenging a core belief will often cement that core belief. Like, and, and don't ever tell people that's wrong. Don't ever directly outwardly like make people feel dumb about what they said. Cause that's like that w when that happens, the brain automatically closes and you push them right into their dogmatic little corner. And you just make, you basically turn the switch for confirmation bias when that happens. Mm -hmm. Like, and there's no way out of it. And so like, just always try to avoid uh, talking about, you know, I just don't tell people they're wrong or stupid or whatever. Like, some, yes. you know, so if Colin said to me something that completely challenged my worldview and he had research, he's like, look, there's a peer reviewed paper on this. Here's the reasons why this doesn't work. And we, here's the reasons why it does. Uh, and I couldn't refute that. If he was not leaving there, leaving any door open for that, what would I do? I would immediately just kind of la la la. I would back up and I would say, whatever, you're just dumb. Mm -hmm. and Deflection. none of that would have it would all have been wasted on me all that knowledge all that stuff yep. dropping yep. rather than saying no man listen i i felt that way i've looked at that stuff here's some of the stuff that i found that might be contrary to that you should definitely check it out do your own research you know what you do have you think to know your audience too yeah. like i can tell you brent some things and just be like no fuck you you're wrong <laughs> well, like, okay, like, that's, like that's different right it's way different but like other people especially someone i just met at a party or someone i know a little bit or like an employer or whatever like I'm very careful to do a dance where I kind of like side, I kind of beat around the bush in a way because you don't want to blatantly come out and be like, that's a bad idea. Yeah. Like nobody likes hearing that, right? But if you're like, well, I actually want to see it this way or I want to try it this way. And, and as a manager and having employees and, and, and doing this in my businesses over the years, I found that I tend to almost never tell someone like it's not good enough or, I, or it's not what I want. I just say, we're going to try something else to test it as like an alternative comparison. And then we end up usually just doing that and that'd be the new thing we do or whatever. Right. Instead of me like saying- But if it's a test and you're going to look at empirical data, it's less challenging and less like like in the example of an employee. If you tell an employee, ah, let's try doing it this way and let's see how it works out. When yes. they think they're doing the right thing, if you tell them the opposite and you're just like, do it this way, now they're going to be like, oh my God, my, my boss is such a 
jerk. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so let I, we should probably wrap this up. We got a little bit into like what arguing is and stuff like that, which is kind of good for our rant well, we're section. Do books suggestions. We yes. want we want to do a little bit of a of a personal life rant thing. Maybe we can talk about a few things. Uh, I think that's the definitely the meat of this show. And then let's do black or let's do books suggestions now. Then we'll wrap up with some whatever we want all right so so uh, i would definitely suggest think twice harnessing the power of counterintuition very specifically talks about all of the biases how you need to just take a step back look at it again and think are any of these biases prevalent uh the drunkard's walk is a really cool examination of kind of how randomness affects the way some people think and and there's a lot more to it and finally, The Black Swan is a really good book about how random events will change the way you think about things and why you think about them and realize that some things are generally unpredictable. All of Taleb's books I've read, yeah, Black, no. Black Swan, Annie Fragile is actually my favorite, and Annie Fragile does cover a lot of similar ideas in here. Black Swan is really great. Fooled by Randomness is good. I'll basically always buy forever anything he puts out. I would add uh, Influence by... Cardini, Robert Cardini, whatever is a good one. Uh, any, oh man, I actually didn't prepare a list. There's, there's quite a bit here, but we'll just stick with that for book recommendations for now, I guess. So, you know, what do you got? What else, Brent? You got anything in your life right now? You got any rants, raves, show recommendations? Uh, Ooh, show recommendations. That's not something. Like Star Trek. I'm watching the new Star Trek. I kind of like it. The, the so show. Star Trek Discovery is very good. Yep. Um, they. A lot of Star Trekkies hate it. I'm about as Star Trekky as you can possibly get, and I very much like it. There is a little bit. They did, did a little bit that's kind of irking, but in the end, yeah. But do you know that the main character? So do you know who Paul Stamets actually is in real life? Yes. So that that is a really <laughs> cool nod that, that they did to real life. When I made that connection, I was like, "This is so cool!" And everything's about the MySQL oh, network. Shit. Uh, star. What's what's the last four year number? I'm sorry. Nine star nine two eight three. I forgot JJ didn't have the key. Okay. Anyway, sorry. Uh, so Paul Stamets. The actual mushroom guy. Yeah. And they, they named the, the main character after him. And there's a mycelial network. It's a, it's a good show. It's great. Like, you know, don't. It, it is a good show. Just and get, yeah. actually, well, here's a bias. Like, and this is something I, I, I think I see a lot in life. You can really, really just approach everything in life in a binary way. Right? Of course. It, it's either useful or it's not. Right? If you really break down everything in life to either be useful or not, and that's ignoring many other variables, whatever, like I'm saying, break it down to just that as a category. I feel like people get hung up on too much nonsense and just, they can't focus on the basics. So like we were talking about like the Star Wars franchise recently and how people are like upset with their whatever. And I definitely see points. I don't really have any skin in the game. I don't really care. But I, then I asked myself, do I enjoy the movies or not? And I do. And yeah. for me, that's all that fucking matters. I don't really care about anything else. Like yeah, some, yeah. some people do because they're so... People got real worked up about yeah. character choices. and. Well, but some people, that is a thing because maybe they can't even enjoy the movies because uh, they see... Because it's part of their identity. Right, they know so much about it that like they can't even enjoy the movie. But yeah. I, I'm, I'm ignorant enough to just enjoy the movie, right? But generally, if you take what value you can from most things... You're just going to be better off in life. It's it's kind of the abundance versus scarcity mindset. Yeah. Like it's, it's I can enjoy myself in any situation. I can find the good in any situation. Positive versus negative thinking, right? If you really, at the end of the day, if you want to have a good life, you just need to really focus more on the positive. I mean, yeah. really, that's what it comes down to. Find the use in things. It's like Bruce Lee said, absorb, absorb everything, discard what is useless, make what is yours your own. We need to find that quote, but yeah, basically, I think you talked about water. I don't know. Well, yeah, he has of course about water. <laughs> so uh, some random other suggestions. I said this the other day, the show you on Netflix is very good. It's kind of like what Dexter should have been, but stopped being after a few seasons. And there's another kind of cool show called Mars. Mars. Yeah. So Mars is like a mini series where it follows the first group of us to land on Mars. And then what, what happens after that? What network? what network is this? It's Netflix. Really? Or actually, it might be Amazon. It's either, it's actually, it's Amazon. It's Amazon. But the beginning takes place with all of these interviews with real people. So there's interviews with like Elon Musk. Really? Neil, Neil deGrasse Tyson. So it takes place in present day, hmm. follows the SpaceX journey of trying to land one of their rockets. And then it. I'm going to have to watch that actually now. It, 
it takes it and then does the fiction of the future of what happens when they actually go. That's and it cool. goes back and forth and it really shows like people will say, well, we're going to have this problem. And then they cut to the future and they're having that problem. Mm -hmm. It's super cool. Yeah. Um, and it's a short series. It's not going to be high drama or anything like that, but it is, uh, it is interesting as far as the mind goes. Absorb way. what is useful, discard what is useless, and add what is specifically your own. That's by Bruce Lee. All right, let's wrap up there. And what are, what's our CTA for people today? I mean, obviously... Think twice. Uh, definitely ask more questions. Question yourself. I mean, like, actually, we're not done. I got to go. We got we to go on this one. Oh, right boy. Here. We're not done yet. So... <laughs> I'm the, not finished. A big thing that I think about a lot is... Is this going to be a value bomb? Yeah, go for it. Okay. Okay. Well, it's going to be a long one, so you might have to throw in a few bombs there in the future. Right. But it's going to be, I try to think about why people do things, right? And a lot of our society and our culture is based on money and fame and more things, right? It's a sickness of more. More attention, more likes, more external validation, more money, right? And I think about all the time how we have like a lot of people that have a lot of money, yet they still spend their entire lives to make more money. It, even though it has almost no utility in their life. When they could just enjoy their money and almost live every second of their life however they wanted, yeah. people still sacrifice all of their time and their entire life to make more that really won't make any difference whatsoever. Infinity plus one billion is still infinity. <laughs> yeah, it's absurd. And so I think the call to action for the average person is to really question yourself. Like, why are you spending so much time on Instagram, right? Why are you looking at people's profiles or, or, or are you, I don't know, but like identify this in yourself. You know, are you looking at, you know, other people's profiles and you're being envious that they get to travel and live these amazing lives and have these amazing bodies and do all these things, right? Are you scrolling aimlessly and just basically feeling bad about yourself, right? Are you trying to put all this time and energy into posting things or doing things so that you can get likes and external validation? Are you trying to do, make a bunch of money so that you can then think in your mind that people, or, or maybe subconsciously, a lot of people don't think this consciously, but they think subconsciously that eventually if I have money, then people will like me and, and I'll get more mates and I'll have more dates and I have all these things, right? But what we've seen is that that just doesn't work. Yet right. people still chase it. And again, biologically, this makes sense. Like humans want resources because the more resources, resources we have, the more we can procreate, the more we can survive. This is just like biology 101. It's never going to go away. So, I mean... What are your thoughts on this, Brent? Like, I think about it all the time. I try to analyze the utility of things I say yes to. I've also identified that there's a certain dollar amount that I want to achieve in my life. And when I go beyond that, I'm not just going to get sucked into more and more and more. And I'm going to actually try to do less and, and use that money as a tool to live exactly how I want. Yeah, people will say all the time, money doesn't buy happiness. And they're empirically wrong based on the data. That, up that, to a point yeah there is a very clear point like there is data on this that once you make a certain amount of money yes you have bought happiness up until that point and then past that point you no longer continue to buy the same equivalent amount of happiness you kind of hit the the what's, cap what's that number i don't remember it's, it's like 70 something yeah. 75k 75 000 and, and a year yeah the, the one reason why is you remove most of the negatives of having to worry about money yes. now i will say that when I didn't have to worry about my bills anymore, my life was infinitely better. Yes. And I think that's true of everybody. Yeah. Like when I finally became debt free and I had enough income to where I didn't have to like pay attention every day if I'm an overdraft or whatever, we've all been there, right? When you get that out of your life, you are going to be quantifiably more happy, yes. right? But when you get to that 75K, 100, 100K, whatever it is, and you can basically like eat when you, whenever you want, you can travel whenever you want, you can kind of live however you want, more money it almost does nothing for you. If you really think about the differences between the rich and, and someone that has like 100K a year, like what, they get to own a yacht and have all the annoying things that have to come along with that. They get to fly private versus commercial. Like there's, it really actually doesn't make much of a difference. And if you really realign your wants and your desires and you have a healthy relationship to what you want in life and what you value in life, most people don't need the crap of the rich and the famous. Right. Yeah. And what you see is a lot of people that are rich and famous end up having more problems because they have more people that steal from them. They have more people that will use them. They have, it's hard to have real relationships. Look at Stan Lee at the end of his life. What was happening to I, him? What was happening? Uh, so he had people that were close to him. Just, they were vultures clawing so at every sad. piece of his estate. Yep. They were, they were suing him. They were getting him to sign things saying that they were his friends. And, and when he, passed away he didn't have much left because he got got by all these people so sad. around him it's, uh, yeah 
It's uh, MC Hammer. I mean, there's like countless football players. Like you know, there's all these examples of these things. And so, but let's how let's go back to what it, this is for the average person, right? The sickness of more, the sickness of external validation. And I recorded a whole YouTube video on this yesterday about how I've just, regardless of what money I have, and I think this is another problem, is that people, they assign their self-worth to this external idea of what people will think about them or what they think they'll think about yeah, them. Yeah, I got my Rolex on. Or... Right. Uh, I have, have 100,000 followers. Like, I'm, I, f- I have validation. Or I have this much money. Or I drive a Mercedes-Benz or BMW or whatever. And so, or I got the new Tesla, right? And most well, that of, one. Most of that, I, I mean, I'll have a Tesla too when I can afford it, but that's just, <laughs> that's just because it's a great car, right? Uh, it is the sickness of more. It's the sickness of external validation. And I think really, really asking yourself questions, really analyzing utility, analyzing how you're spending your money, analyzing just, I mean, the, the amount of crap that people buy to just fill that, that hole is just, it's mind boggling. So, I mean, what can, what can people do about this? Like, how, how can you not get sucked in to the draw of wanting to post on your Instagram to get all these likes or to, like, buy the newest Jordans or shoes or, I, I don't know, I don't know what, like, teenagers do nowadays, but I'm sure there's, like, fashion that they buy and all these things of, of trying to compete and, and maintain certain status quo and, you know, getting external validation. Like, what can people do to stop falling into this? Because I see people that fall into their entire lives, their entire lives. They're 50 years old and they're making a bunch of money, they have a bunch of money, and they still work 90 hours a week to make more money. It makes no sense to me. Yeah. Right? So what can we do about this? Like, how I don't do we, know. It's, how do we it's fall almost like these, these brain loops that people will get into. They feel like they have to continue to work 90 hours a week. They feel like they have to have more and more money. They have lifestyle creep. There's a lot of different reasons behind it. I do not know the answer for that because there are times when having 100,000 followers on Instagram can be very beneficial to you. There's times when... Having a a thousand likes on your post can be very beneficial to you. I can tell you what I did as far. I was, I used to post on Facebook all the time and I still post on Facebook all the time. However, I post on Facebook all the time via a, um, an automated poster. I post about controversial topics. And the only reason I do it is because I want to keep people clicking on my stuff. So that when I feed them an ad or I start giving them something interesting, saying, Hey, I started a podcast that I'm still in their feed of activity and they'll check me out. So I've no, I noticed that the stuff that was controversial got the most action. I deleted everything on my Facebook from before March of last Why? year. Why? Uh, I did that because of the Cambridge Analytica thing and realized so, how much this, of their data that they yeah, actually but this, had. So this wasn't a personal thing? What? This wasn't a personal thing? Well, no, but, I, but I, was, I was getting there. Don't interrupt me. I became happier the more that I was off of Facebook, even though yeah. people did engage with me and talk to me and say cool things to me. Like I was... Not like an influencer or famous, but like I got a lot of what you would think was positive validation on Facebook. I do not miss not being on there and constantly looking at it on my phone and reloading it and all that stuff. I never use Instagram. I, I begrudgingly post on Twitter because I have to to promote the show and stuff like that. But. I'll never be on Twitter. So yeah, Digital Minimalism by Cal Newport is a book I just read, which basically talks about this, uh, how people just not being on it is better for happiness. He also talks about if you're going to use social media, use it kind of the way you're doing it. Like have a system and only use the platform within the confines of that system. And people are just, when they do this, they're just so much happier in every way. Yeah. Now, obviously this is a more specific point about social media and the, the my idea, my rant, my, my, my topic, my question, my CTA, my call to action is just like, how can we prevent the sickness of more? How can we question our motivations and question the things we do? Maybe decide what would make you happy today and like say this is what i want this would make me happy all i would need is this th- amount maybe that's 75,000 a year maybe it's 100,000 a year and then when you reach that stop stop moving the goalpost stop saying well now that i'm here in the spot that made me happy i think maybe i need these other things just remember back when you were not as happy as you are now these were the things you needed to make yourself happy so now that you're there just let it go yeah I be mean, happy obviously that's like a long timeline. There's a lot of things we should do. We should always be questioning ourselves, but I feel like we need to become as self-aware as we can now and every day. So, cause if you are working to make 75 K a year and you're making not much now, you might not remember and you get sucked into that sickness of more. Mm-hmm. We get sucked. We all get sucked into it. Like our modern world sucks us into it. Uh, so I get, I don't know the answer. I, I think, I think all the biases that we talked about today are things that we need to be aware of. These are going to help you. The more you can be aware of why you do things, why you want things, 
uh, you know, understand your biology, which is why you're here at the ancestral mind, is you're trying to understand why you get sucked into these things. Why do you want external validation, right? Why do you want people to like you? Like, at least first understand it, then you can find ways to combat it. And I, I'm only speaking from experience here, but I feel like the number one thing that I've been able to do to combat that is to just really, really, really hone in on my why for life, to really, really hone in on the things that I want to do, how I want to spend my time, how I want to live my life and really paint a picture of that. And like, I've, I've made comments before, like if I was making like a million a year as like a, you know, full, full-time employee, I don't even know if I would be able to sustain that because I'd have to show no. up to work every day and do something someone said. And I just don't think it would fit with my biology. So I kind of accepted that. Right. I, you know, maybe 10 million a year would be the number. I don't even know. And I still think I wouldn't be able to sustain it for my entire life. Right. Uh, so, uh, so that's what the, that's, I, that's why we talked about it on the dating episode. Ask somebody why they do what they do. You know, why are you? you yeah, it's a good question. Dude. If you can't be happy, no matter what, with a boss directly telling you, do this, do that, do that. It doesn't matter if you're making 10 million, no 1 mo- million, or 100,000. Yeah, no amount of money. No amount of money will, will be able to change that, right? So that's why you have to really figure out who you are, what you want, what you believe. And, and here's the thing that, you know, this is how we're going to end. We're going to end the show on this one thing. How do you want to spend every day for the rest of your life? No one thinks about this. We, we, we think about what cars we can buy, what houses we can buy, how much income can we make, how, much, how many stocks can we own, or like all these number-based things. Instead, we should think about how do we want to live? How do we want to spend every second of every day and then try to engineer the finances, the money, and the things around that yeah. goal? And so my goal, and I've been thinking about this for years, ever since I read 4-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss, I want to be able to travel around the entire world, go stay in other countries for months on end, do my work that I care about, which for me, I want to do a lot of writing. I want to do, I want to keep building the ancestral mind, do things like that. I want to keep helping people, educating people, but I want to have work that I can do from anywhere in the world and work anytime I want. And if I don't feel good or I want to take the day off, I have the ability to do that. And in, in, in a lot of ways, I already have that, but I still have some goals I'm trying to reach to really secure my finances for my family or whatever. So like, I still have a few more years to go towards this, but once I reach those goals and I've, and I've established like I have this money, I have, I have this, this freedom, I'm going to then go and take advantage of that. Or at least yeah. that's the plan. Like hopefully I don't get sucked into something else, but you know, this is something that I'm consciously aware of. Like as we raise money for wild foods and there's a lot of big things that are happening, I have to constantly, like I told investors yesterday, I basically was like, listen guys, if we do a deal, all I want to do is I want to build my podcast and I want to build my YouTube. If you guys handle the rest and we make sure the quality is high because that's what wild food stands for, I'm going to be happy. And the reality is though, if I'm going to do that, I'm probably giving up some things, right? I'm probably giving up value or long-term growth or even just dollars in my bank account, right? Because I would be doing something that would save me a lot of time. I, you know, I don't even want to be CEO eventually. Like I want to eventually hire a CEO so that I can just be, do content. And it's, but it's like the only reason I can even go there, right? The only reason I can say I'm okay not being CEO of my company, like, I have no ego attached to it. You know how many people can't do that? You know how many people like have to be the CEO of their company? Like even if they're not the best person to do that, you see this crap all the time. Yep. Mm-hmm. I am so okay with not being the CEO. Like I don't want to be a CEO. Like, I don't want to manage a team of people and, and all these different things. I want to just do my content, right? And, 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 and educate people. So understanding who you are, what you want, and really ask yourself, how do you want to live every day in life? And this is something that we talked about recently, Brand. It was like, I, th- I think we talked about this. We're just basically like, let's analyze how we want to spend every day of our life for like, how do we actually want to live our lives and try to build? Did we talk about that? I must be like, not even you're putting, I, we've, I think we talked about, did that. we talk about it very specifically like two days ago? I have no idea, but have we talked about that in the past all the time? I think since you moved here, when we were talking about like the new business, just like yeah. figuring out like, no, cause I, this is what I did. I asked you, I said, Brent, what is your ideal life? And you said something kind of similar to mine. Like, yeah, you want to be able to work anywhere in the world and have it from an internet connection. Yep. Right. And that's kind of the dream of most people. And it's, the thing is, it's so attainable. You'd be a freelancer making a few thousand dollars a month living in the Philippines and like living like a king whilst investing the rest of your money. Like that could be an amazing life. You don't need to have hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars. Like the idea that you need to have money to be happy is just completely, it's flipped. Like yeah. the economy we have today, is, it's just the, the world we live in is completely different. So much opportunity. So then people go live in Miami and they're like, oh, I need to have. Or New York. And yeah. I need to make a hundred K to even like get by. Like it's insane or LA or whatever. So, all right. All right. That's that is it. a good place to wrap up. We've done it. So We've done it. Send us recommendations, questions, comments, praise, whatever to ancestralmind at gmail.com. And my name is Colin Stuckert, founder, CEO of Wildfoods Co. and ancestralmind.com. Here with Brent from the Crypto Basic Podcast. Yo, yo, yo. Thanks for listening.
And remember any advice you might have heard, that's do your own research. We're not advisors on anything. Anything you do or say from this podcast is at your own risk. Own period. risk. That's period. it. Period.